From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South. I am Kishan Hines. Cuban legislators met for the first regular session of the ninth legislature of the National Assembly, where the new cabinet was presented. The president and 605 National Assembly members presented the vice president and members of the ministerial council, all except one of the former vice presidents on the Council of Ministers under Raul Castro will remain in place. Now, lively debate is also underway about the draft constitutional reform before it is submitted to popular consultation prior to a referendum. To ratify as Vice President of the Council of Ministers, Commander of the Revolution, Ramiro Valdez Menendez, Ricardo Cabriza Ruiz, and Ulises Rosales del Toro, Army Corps General, Leopoldo Sintras Frias as Minister of Revolutionary Armed Forces, Vice Admiral Julio Cesar Gandarilla as Minister of Interior, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla as Minister of Foreign Relations. And so the Council of Ministers will be composed of 34 members, with an average after of 60 years old, 8 are women, making up 23%. 9 are black or mixed, so 26%. And so I take advantage of the moment to recognize in this parliament the recognition of work and outlook in the fulfillment of all who fulfill their responsibilities and take on new roles. Thanks to all. Peru has a new justice minister after corruption allegations forced the former minister to resign. Vincente Ceballos was sworn in after Peruvian President Martin Vizcarra asked former Justice Minister Salvador Heresi to resign. On Friday, that decision came Senor. after a TV station released a recording Antonio of a phone conversation Ibaio. between the minister and a judge. In the recordings, judges appear to be discussing plans to trade favors, help convicted criminals, and secure jobs for friends. The revelation sparked protest in the country. And Peru's Congress also agreed to remove the seven members of the National Council of the Judiciary. While this scandal of the judicial corruption spreads, implicating not just the judiciary, but politicians as well. The Peruvian legislature unanimously approved the removal of the National Council of the Judiciary after proving that some of its members took part in acts of corruption. They say they were obligated to do so after increased public pressure. We have to act with greatest conviction to eradicate the corruption of the country, corruption that has turned the National Council of the Judiciary into a black market where influences are trafficked, into a black market where sentences are transferred. The next step will be to declare, through a constitutional amendment, the reorganization of the Council of the Judiciary within a period of nine months. However, for the progressive movements, these measures are not enough. We are talking about a terrible situation for the country. Corruption is normalizing. Corruption is institutionalizing. Corruption does not separate autonomy of the powers. The public ministry swore in the new national prosecutor, Pedro Chavari, but there are now doubts over the appointment after media released a recording in which he allegedly planned the exchange of favors with the dismissed Supreme Judge Cesar Hinostroza. Asumir con esas irregularidades. To assume with those irregularities, with those alleged crimes by the nation's prosecutor, they should have little shame. It is a scandal. And I think that the people have to continue going out to the streets because that Mr. Chavarri has the support of this political group, the Fujimoris. One person has been charged in the scandal. The court sentenced former president of the Court of Justice in Calau, Walter Rios, with 18 months of preventative detention. 
the Honduran Supreme Court has issued arrest warrants for 38 officials implicated in the Box of Pandora or Pandora's Box corruption case. The case made headlines when 38 public officials, including congressmen and women from the ruling National Party, allegedly stole public funds. It was reported that some of that money was embezzled for the 2013 presidential campaign of Juan Orlando Hernandez. In the recent months, several high-profile corruption cases have been exposed. And strike action continues over in Honduras over fuel prices, and those could go on until Monday. Representatives from the National Transport Council organized a caravan in the capital, Tegucigalpa, on Saturday and vowed to continue strike action into Monday. The union is requesting a 20 lempira rebate on the price of fuel. Sí, claro, estamos apoyando aquí. We are supporting the struggles, the just causes of the people, because honestly, we can withstand a rise in the cost of fuel, as we have said. There have been many increases this year, and we need to support each other. We ought to all come out and mobilize and be with the people. In Mexico, two elected officials of the soon-to-be ruling Morena Party were executed on Friday by unknown shooters. El Zio Delgado, the mayor-elect of the city of Buena Vista, was murdered in a restaurant, while Zenon Corcula, an elected councilman for the city of San Pedro in the state of Jalisco, was killed when four unidentified men opened fire on his vehicle. Local media reported he was accompanied by his son, who was uninjured. Our correspondent Pablo Perez from Mexico City has more in this report. The initial investigations have begun in the case of the elect public officials who were murdered yesterday in the state of Michoacán and in the state of Jalisco. The mayor of Buenavista, Michoacán, Eliseo Delgado, was killed in his own municipality. The governor said that we must not jump to conclusions. Not only is there the possibility of organized crime involvement, but also two mayors have been murdered in recent years. In the meantime, we await official updates from authorities. Thank you, Pablo. In Nicaragua, the campaign for justice of the victims of terrorism marched to demand justice for families who have suffered during the three months of violence. Some demonstrators were seen holding photos of murdered loved ones and police officers killed during this period. The demonstrators say that since the protests began in April, innocent people have been kidnapped, tortured, raped, injured, and many of them have lost homes due to vandalism. The violence has also affected many Nicaraguans' ability to go to their jobs, and some no longer have the means to work. That's why we're demanding justice so that the cop loaders of the right wing are punished. They want to see the Nicaraguan people subjected under the imperialists. That's why we tell them today, person is each one of our comrades who offer their lives for the peace. Because in Nicaragua, all Nicaraguans want peace. And a congressman from the FMLN El El Salvador, Manuel Flores, echoed many in the party who are speaking out in favor of non-intervention in neighboring countries. Flores said the best way to support the crisis is to support a process of dialogue. Leave it to Nicaraguans to resolve their own problems. And if we are going to contribute to something, it ought to be in the dialogue for peace. That is what Salvadorans are known for throughout the world, as people who want peace, a people that say, enough with the deaths. What are we then, promoters of violence, promoters of death, or promoters of dialogue and peace? Yes to dialogue in Nicaragua. Yes to peace in Nicaragua. Staying in El Salvador, the Special Electoral Commission for the FMLN delivered election materials on Friday for Sunday's internal election for vice president. The election will determine who runs alongside Hugo Martinez in the country's presidential election in February. Martinez was elected in May as the pre-candidate to run for the FMLN against the country's right-wing arena party. Karina Sosa, who is running for the post of vice president as well, was among those who traveled to McAllen, Texas, to visit migrant mothers and fathers who were separated from their children. The Salvadorian delegation met with U.S. Border Patrol authorities, where they expressed concern over the separation of children from parents, a great number of which migrated from El Salvador and the Northern Triangle. 
visitar para poder... We are grateful for this opportunity to have been able to visit with the mothers, the fathers, the children who've been separated under these conditions. Yesterday we had our first visit, and believe me, it would break anyone's heart. Let's take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. All eyes were on the Colombian Parliament on Friday, but for different reasons at times. The former mayor of Bogota and former presidential candidate Antanas Mocas pulled down his pants in the middle of Congress on Friday. Colombia launched a historic session dubbed by President Santos as the most diverse ever. Now after the show, Mocas pulled up his pants and returned to his seat. He was called to order, but there was no further punishment. There was a lot more to that session than that. On Friday, we spoke to Richard McCall, an independent journalist in Bogota, to discuss this historic day in Colombian democracy. Richard, thanks for joining us. First of all, do you consider today a historic day? Do you think that this new pluralist government will be a game changer for Colombia? Uh, well, thank you. It's, uh, it's an interesting day, as always, in Colombian politics. Yes, the FARC or the ex-FARC, uh, FARC combatants now who've moved into politics are in government. There's five of them, five of the former combatants in the Senate and five in Congress. And this is transcendental for Colombia. After so many years of war, these uh, what were belligerent uh, political actors have put down their arms and they're in Congress. How much they'll be able to change is up for debate. But yes, it's an interesting time. But when you look around at the faces in Congress and in the Senate, there's a lot of the similar faces that have been there over many terms before. So you've got a few changes, but uh, as you saw in the elections and in the legislative elections, Colombia's uh, polit politics has swung to the right. So how much can the FARC actually achieve within this political spectrum is uh, up for debate. Well, you said it was up for debate. So is it wrong for me to ask you how impactful you think they could be or they will be in this um, parliament, is Senate, sorry? Well, the, Im the impact is there, the very, the very fact that they're there. I mean, this is a huge deal for Colombia. It's, it's, hopefully, this can go some way to changing the FARC's image in the eyes of the average Colombian. You know, there's a stigma surrounding the FARC uh, uh, due to so many uh, five decades plus, five decades of, of conflict. There is a stigma around them. So 
they'll be looking to change their image. They'll be looking to change their image in the minds of the people. But it is an interesting uh, situation that you have a, a, a firm opposition of five different parties, six different parties together, who are in favor of peace. So they are going to be there with the FARC, and these, will, of course, will include the Alianza Verde, the Polo uh, Democratico, and others. So there's, there's a solid base. In Ecuador, members of the National Electoral Council have been dismissed. Ecuador's Transity Council for Citizen Participation ordered the removal, claiming that members failed to comply with their duties. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, has the details. The Ecuadorian Temporary Council for Citizen Participation and Social Control voted unanimously to remove all officials of the National Electoral Council. The CNA members will have three days to present an official request to appeal the Council's decision. In some cases, it is clear that resolutions made by the National Electoral Council were linked to the interest of the previous administration. After the Council's resolution, the president of the CNN tweeted a statement rejecting the statement, calling it unconstitutional and illegal. The CNN vice president accepted the resolution. As I have said before, I do not plan to make any sort of appeal and I give myself over the Council's will. Recent latest actions taken by the temporary council, including the removal of several authorities close to the former government, has some analysts calling the decision authoritarian. This institution has served political maneuvering that seeks to dismantle what has been achieved and allow the return of former powers that control the state. It's evident that the council has served a key role in dismantling a system that blocked these corrupt powers from being in control again. The temporary council has also decided to remove the head of the superintendency of banks for allegedly not complying with his duties. During his defense hearing, the superintendent submitted evidence to prove that he had fulfilled all his obligations effectively and professionally. Denise Herrera, Telesur Quito, Ecuador. Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno has begun a week-long international tour starting in the UK. On Monday, he will attend the Global Disability Summit at the Reina Isabel Olympic Park, where he's expected to deliver a speech. After his meetings in London, he will then make his way to the University of Edinburgh to explore the potential for collaboration in the energy sector. After concluding his tour of the UK, Moreno will travel to Spain to discuss options for cooperating in the fight against human trafficking, security and intelligence sharing. The presence of the International Monetary Fund in Buenos Aires, Argentina was met with mass protests. Hundreds of Argentines gathered in the downtown area to mount pressure on Christine Lagarde, director of the IMF, who's in the capital for the G20 meeting. The Argentinian government and IMF reached an agreement in June for a three-year, $50 billion standby agreement. As part of the deal, the government pledges to accelerate plans to reduce the fiscal deficit. Chile has become a place of refuge for Haitian migrants, including rapper Wesley Lotog, who is a star in the Haitian community of Santiago. Lotog now aims to raise the plight of Haitians and make his native culture known to Chileans through his music. There are many other Haitians, many of my compatriots, who suffer racism. That's why I use my voice to speak for them. I make music here in Chile, in a country that is not my own, and I do it in Creole so that Chileans start to understand Haitians and for them to start appreciating the Haitian culture. On Friday, Trinidadian marijuana activist Nasma Mula presented a petition to Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley in support of the legalization of marijuana. Prime Minister Rowley had told citizens last week decriminalization was not a priority for Trinidad, which prompted anger amongst the population. During their encounter, the Prime Minister could be heard telling Ms. Mueller, let's not fight over this, as he invited her to a meeting with him and the Attorney General to address her concerns. At the CARICOM Heads of Government meeting earlier this month, the Marijuana Commission presented their report, which calls for decriminalization of the drug.
It's a, it's a great day for Trinidad and Tobago. The Prime Minister has indicated that he is willing to have a conversation, that um, he's going to invite me to meet with him and the Attorney General and to discuss, for me, the legalization of cannabis. It is an, I think he recognizes it is a golden opportunity for us as a country and for him as a leader to leapfrog from the back and get to the front on this global cannabis industry to help people who are suffering from cancer, epilepsy, all sorts of diseases, chronic pain. In a story you'll only see on Telesur, a special documentary looking at 25 years after the victims of Chevron's Texaco's environmental disaster in the Ecuadorian Amazon filed a lawsuit demanding reparations for its contamination. We spoke with the team behind the documentary, A Cancer in the Amazon, producers Adriano Contreras and Ivan Castaneda. So what this documentary is really about is uh, to sort of bring, bring back this case, which, um, which recently had a, a sort of small victory again with a reaffirmation of the $9.5 billion that Texaco is, tech, well Chevron Texaco, now part of Chevron, owes uh, the victims here in, in Ecuador in terms of like reparations of, um, of uh, rebuilding, rebuilding, cleaning, uh, healthcare, uh, cancer treatment, that kind of stuff. Uh, and this documentary sort of really dives into like the testimony it's fully told by the people in the Ecuadorian Amazon who were completely affected by it. And we went to the Amazon and in the Amazon we spent like three, four days over there. We already have like connections, good connections over there, so they help us like to do things really fast actually. Like going to the old pits, uh, talking with people with cancer, uh, interviewing uh, organizations that are there struggling. And that documentary is on our social media pages. So we'll take, we'll take another short break now after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. A funeral was held for 27-year-old Mohammed Barwan, who was shot dead in Gaza on Friday by Israeli forces during protest. The Gaza Strip was hit by a series of airstrikes, causing civilian casualties after an Israeli soldier was killed. Hamas confirmed on Saturday that they had accepted a ceasefire, thwarting a possibility of war. China's President Xi Jinping arrived in Senegal for a two-day visit to sign bilateral deals. It's the first leg of an African tour at a time when the continent has seen significant Chinese investment in the minerals and construction industry. The Chinese president's trip will also take him to Rwanda and South Africa for a summit of the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Zimbabwe's President Emerson Manangagwa has been addressing the white electorate as part of his election campaign ahead of the July 30th elections. Manangagwa is competing against Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the Movement for Democratic Change, in what is expected to be a tight contest. There will be about 30,000 white Zimbabweans who are reportedly more inclined toward the MDC or other opposition parties due to hostilities with Manangagwa's ruling ZANU-PF party which he hopes to turn around. It's about time. It's been so many years. Um, 
it's, it's nice. I mean, I praise God for this. This is incredible. Because he's recognizing everyone as the same. We are all one now, which is beautiful. This has never happened before. So it's good. The popular party has elected a new leader. Here's more on that and other headlines from around the world. Okay. But that guess we don't have that, but that takes us to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telesortv.net slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesor English, I'm Kijan Haynes. Thank you for watching. by inequalities, abuse of power, and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepening to the search of files which uncover the empire's